Brothers and sisters, once again, I greet you in the name of the triune God. As I continue to pray that grace and peace would be multiplied to you in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to the glory of God the Father. Let me invite you to turn your Bibles with me to the third chapter of the book of 1 Timothy. We'll be launching out from verses 14 and 15, although we will be uh, kind of all over our Bibles this morning. You know, it wasn't all that long ago that the month of June was nothing more than the beginning of summer vacation. It was a month that all of us could look forward to as it held the promise of pool parties, trips to the beach, vacations, and long, lazy afternoons. But I think we all know that today, for Christians, the month of June is one of the worst months of the year. It is a month when the followers of Christ must exercise an extra measure of vigilance to protect themselves and to protect their kids from the cultural onslaught of Pride Month. For the next 30 days or so, you will not be able to turn on your TV, open a web browser, scroll through social media, go to the market, listen to the radio, watch a ball game, or drive down the road without somehow being encouraged, if not coerced, into celebrating that which the Bible calls an abomination. Now, if the church is meant to be anything for the people of God, it is meant to be a refuge of truth in a world that is filled with lies. I think that's what the Apostle Paul was getting at in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, when he wrote this, I, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. For nearly 2,000 years, the church has stood as a pillar, as a stronghold of truth against the relentless, persistent, insidious lies of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And so in light of all of that, and particularly in light of my love for this congregation, I've decided for the foreseeable future as a part of the regular preaching ministry of this church every June, to take some time to address the lies of Pride Month. And I, I want to be very clear about the fact that the whole celebration of Pride Month and everything that it represents is a lie. When a full-grown biological man named William Thomas, now known as Leah Thomas, declares himself to be a woman, joins a women's swim team, showers in the women's locker, and begins shattering Ivy League women's swim team records, friends, that's a lie. That is a weak, predatory man abusing women, and shockingly, a culture that celebrates that abuse of women. When a New Zealand weightlifter named Gavin Hubbard, who wasn't really able to compete in men's weightlifting, decided that he was a woman, competed, winning multiple women's title, and was subsequently named, this man was named, Sports Woman of the Year, that's a lie. That's a man who couldn't cut it in his own field of competition and who began stealing sporting titles from women. It's a lie. When male inmates in California penitentiaries are allowed to declare themselves to be women so they can be transferred to women's prisons, that's a lie. And the state knows it's a lie because soon after the state began distributing contraceptives in those very women's prisons. And apparently, there are no limits to which the cultural left will not go to prop up the lies of Pride Month. 
Peter Vlaming found that out the hard way when he was fired from his position as a Virginia school teacher for refusing to use transgender pronouns, for, for refusing to participate in the lie of transgenderism. You see, that the whole issue of pronouns is not about hospitality. It is not about graciousness. It is not about trying to make people feel comfortable. It is a demand that we partake of the lie, that we participate in the lie that a man is a woman. And that is something that faithful Christians cannot do. But again, apparently there, there are no limits to what the cultural left will do to prop up the lie of Pride Month. We saw that a few years ago when a ninth grade girl was raped by a boy in a skirt who identified as non-binary in a public school in Loudoun County, Virginia. And that was as a result of a federally enforced co-ed bathroom policy. And then when that girl's father was arrested for speaking up at a school board meeting about what happened to his daughter. And then later we learned that that, county super, that school superintendent subsequently lied, cover what had up covered up what had happened to the man's daughter, and transferred the boy to a neighboring school where he did the same thing. All of that to prop up the lie of transgenderism. There seems to be no limits to which the cultural left will not go in order to prop up the lies that are represented by Pride Month. And so they'll, they'll just have to forgive us when we hear the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus perform the song, A Message from the Great Gay Community, which contains the haunting refrain, we're coming for your children and we'll convert your children. And we're told that they're only joking. You'll have to forgive us for wondering if that too is a lie. For Christians, all of this feels like a dystopian novel that's come true in real life. And if, if you're wondering how we got here, there are two landmark Supreme Court cases that more or less set the stage for the dystopian novel that we're all living in right now. The Obergefell decision of 2015 legalized homosexual marriage nationwide, declaring any denial of LGBT rights to represent an attack on human dignity. Most of us are probably familiar with that one. The Bostock decision of 2020, which probably fewer of us are familiar with, but was effectively, um, had a, has had a greater effect on our country than even Obergefell. The Bostock decision of 2020 granted civil rights protections to the transgender movement. And so after the Bostock decision, the number of pediatric gender clinics, what a horrible euphemism that is for child abuse. The number of pediatric gender clinics in this, ro in this country rose from one to nearly 100 since Bostock in 2020. It was Bostock, that compelled government schools to institute LGBT indoctrination clinics that parents are not allowed to withdraw their children from or even to know that their children are required to participate in, in many cases. It was the Bostock the decision that ushered in what can only be called a mass hysteria of transgender identity, which has captured the minds and mutilated the bodies of teenage girls across this country. Interestingly, the deciding vote in both decisions, Obergefell and Bostock, was cast by a justice who had been nominated to the Supreme Court by a Republican president. In the case of Obergefell, it was Anthony Kennedy who had been nominated by none other than Ronald Reagan. In the case of Bostock, it was Neil Gorsuch, who had been nominated by Donald Trump. 
Now, I only point that out in, to, in order to remind all of us that as important as it is to vote for the right candidates, please do not believe the lie that politics can save you. That, that we are only one election away from making everything right again. You see, friends, there is only one Savior. There is only one true King, and He has no need to run for office. Long ago, He told us exactly what happens to a nation that abandons God. Turn over in your Bibles to the first chapter of the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. And, and in this passage, written so many thousands of years ago, the Apostle Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, walks us through the degradation and the dissolution of a society. And the way Paul describes it is in terms of four revolutions that ultimately lead to the degradation and the disillusionment of a society. If you look at chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. And then in verses 21 through 23, what we find is the first of these revolutions is what we would call a Darwinian revolution. A, a revolution that simply denies God. Verses 18 through 20 are about the obviousness of the existence of God. And in verses 21 through 23, we find this first revolution, which denies God. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And the first step in the loss of a society is a Darwinian revolution where more or less they forsake God. The second step is a sexual revolution. Look at verses 24 and 25. Therefore, so when a society decides to abandon God, God in a sense abandons that society. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. And you don't have to think too far back to see the second step in our own society's degradation taking place in the 60s and the 70s in our own sexual revolution. The third revolution is a homosexual revolution, verses 26 and 27. For this reason, God gave them up to a dishonorable passion. For their women exchange natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Again, you don't have to think too far back, the 70s, 80s, really on forward the homosexual revolution that has happened in our own country. You might think of the advent of AIDS back in the 80s, and especially in the 90s, men receiving the due penalty for their error. I mean, all of this was predicted long ago, but, but the end of the whole matter, the final revolution is in verses 28 through 32, and, and that's when fi God finally just completely gives up on them and gives them over to what's called a debased mind. Verse 28, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. 
They, are, they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malicious, they, uh, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God. Does this sound like the evening news to you? It should. Insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, think about this in relation to Pride Month, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Is that not what is demanded of us every June? That we celebrate and approve of these evil deeds. The debased mind is clearly where we are as a society. I can think no, of no better example of the debased mind that Paul talks about here than the, con, the uh, confirmation hearings of Justice Katanji Brown-Jackson, who ironically was nominated by the Biden administration because of the fact that she is a black woman. When asked the very simple, very straightforward question, what is a woman? she found herself virtually at a loss for words. At first, she essentially refused to answer and eventually declared that she was incompetent to answer that question because she is not a biologist. That is a debased mind. It is a mind that is unable to make the most basic distinctions between what is and what isn't. And furthermore, it is a judgment upon this country that her leaders are so committed to the lies that are represented by Pride Month that they have become spiritually deaf, dumb, blind, and stupid. Turn over just a couple of pages to the second chapter of the book of 2 Thessalonians. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 9, we read about this debased mind, what Paul calls here a strong delusion, particularly in reference to the coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist. Look what it says in verse 9. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion. I think that's similar to the debased mind. God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Is that not the world that we live in today? But the question I'd like to try to address this morning is given all of that, how then shall we live? What does it look like to be a faithful Christian today in a world that is surrounded by such malevolent, malevolent pernicious, malignant, and pervasive lies? How shall we then live? What are Christians to do. I think the Bible tells us that there are three things that we should do. Number one, do not be surprised. Number two, recognize the times. And number three, stand. Stand firm. What are Christians to do in the midst of a month like this? In a society such as this, do not be surprised. Recognize the times. Stand. Stand firm. 
Let's take a look at the first of those. Do not be surprised. One of the great dangers that we all face right now, especially if you're over 30, is it's kind of shocking where we find ourselves. You could be tempted to believe that God is not on his throne, as if this has just come about somehow. And that's, that's why this is such an important point. We should not be surprised. Here's three, just three reasons why you should not be surprised about what's happening in the world around you. Number one, just realize the fact that our adversary, the devil, is a liar. He has always been a liar. And so it is no surprise with the sway that he has in this country that we are surrounded by such awful lies. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 says it like this. It says, no wonder for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. And isn't that the way that Pride Month is celebrated every year? Rainbows, a symbol of God's promise never to flood the earth again. A promise of God's patience and forbearance with humanity has been robbed from us, co-opted by the LGBT agenda and turned into a symbol of unbridled sexual promiscuity, passion, debauchery, and evil. But that's not surprising. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. We've read his playbook. This, this makes perfect sense. The Bible tells us the truth that he is a liar and a deceiver. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9 says, And the great dragon was throw da- thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. Uh, Jesus called him the father of lies. John 8, 44, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. We should not be surprised. Our adversary, the devil, is a liar. It's no wonder that the world is filled with lies. Another reason we should not be surprised is because humanity is hopelessly lost and sinful and has been so since the fall of Adam and Eve. Genesis chapter 6, we'll get back here next week. But Genesis chapter 6, now think this is the indictment on humanity, and this is basically from the very beginning. Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's us. That's humanity. And the reason we should not be surprised is that's always been humanity. Third reason we should not be surprised. The Bible told us this would happen. First Peter chapter four. We covered this a few years ago. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Earlier in the book, he says it like this, beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. And I reminded of this so many times several years ago as we worked through the books of 1 and 2 Peter, but friends, we're not home yet. This is not where we belong. We, We live in enemy territory. And so we should not be surprised when the enemies of God act like the enemies of God. We should be appalled by the depravity of the world around us. 
we should be heartbroken by the effects of that depravity, particularly among the least of these. But we should not be surprised. Rather, we need to recognize the times. We need to recognize the times. All of a sudden, Christian people feel like they've woken up in a different world. And in a sense, that's not far from the truth. One scholar, uh, Aaron Wren, I don't know if you've heard of him before, he, um, a few years ago, offered up just a profoundly helpful analysis of what's happened to American society. Um, And he recently released a book called Life in the Negative World that kind of fleshes out this this analysis. It, It goes something like this. Prior to 1994, and you can kind of quibble about the dates, Um, The the scheme is the important thing. Prior to 1994, in the U.S., Christians experienced what's called life in the positive world. Um, And life in the positive world meant meant this. It, It was a time when to be a Christian was to enjoy a measure of social capital, Uh, Christian values, Christian ethics were more or less the norms of society. And and to violate those norms had uh, brought consequences with it. That was life in the positive world. Doesn't mean everybody was a Christian. Doesn't mean everybody always behaved according to Christian norms. But more or less as a society, and this goes you know, all the way back to the Revolutionary War and really prior to that, that was life in the positive world. Christianity and Western civilization prior to 1994 was more or less viewed as a societal good. I am old enough to remember politicians who had... Um, <laughs> one particular politician who claimed to have put a joint in his mouth, but not to have inhaled. And what's interesting, he felt like he had to say that because he lived in a world where Christian norms would say that's a bad thing. I'm old enough to remember days when politicians, when they were caught having an affair, would you know probably lose their job because... Life in the positive world meant that there were consequences for violating Christian norms. But sometime around 1994, and Wren chose 1994 because that was the year of the conservative resurgence when the Republicans took the House uh, in such like a a dramatic fashion. It was kind of the high water mark, so to speak. After 1994, Christians entered what's called life in the neutral world. In life in the neutral world, Society took more of a neutral stance towards Christianity. To be publicly known as a Christian was really neither positive nor negative. Christianity was essentially one uh, valid option among many in a pluralistic society. And so it was at this time frame in particular where you had the rise of men like Tim Keller who would really like specialize in cultural engagement and sitting down, having a conversation and you know, being able to dialogue about these matters. It was a neutral world. You could have a conversation like that. But somewhere around 2014, Christians entered what's called life in the negative world. And the reason that Wren chose 2014 is it's just prior to the Obergefell decision of 2015. But in life in the negative world, society now has a negative view of Christianity. So much so that today, being a Christian, being a a real Christian, like a Christian that actually believes it, that may come with significant negative social consequences. That's especially true on the elite levels of society. But really across the board today, being a Christian, a real Christian, it very well might cost you your job. Now, if like me, you were born in the positive world, Jimmy Carter was only halfway through his uh, term when I was born. If, like me, you were born in the positive world, this new negative world 
it seems like you live in a foreign country. Reminds me of a scene in the opening chapters of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Frodo had, had just learned the nature of the ring that his uncle Bilbo had, had given him, the terrible evil that was contained within it. Frodo is talking to Gandalf and he says, I wish it need not have happened in my time. To which Gandalf replies, so do I. And so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. You see, friends, we need to recognize the times in which we live. We need to be like the men of Issachar. In 1 Chronicles 12, 32, it says, uh, the men of Issachar, they were men who had understandings of, understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. The, cultural, or the culture around us has changed to such a degree that the only thing left for us to do now is to stand. Do not be surprised. Recognize the times and stand. Turn over to the sixth chapter of the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter six, we have this marvelous passage on the uh, armor of God. What I want you to notice here is just how many times the, the command to us, having put on the armor of God, how many times the command to us is simply to stand. Look at verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. And he continues on and lists out the armor of God. But the command is plain enough. What are we to do? Stand. We are to stand uncompromisingly on the truth of the word of God. The truth that homosexuality is not an alternative lifestyle to be celebrated, it is an abomination. Leviticus 18.22, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman, it is an abomination. Leviticus 20.13, if a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. We stand on the truth that those who actively participate in the homosexual lifestyle will not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you. We stand on the truth that pride is a great sin, which will inevitably lead to a great fall. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. The call of the present moment is for Christians to stand. Do not be surprised. Recognize the times. Stand. 
It was on February 12th of 1974 that Russian citizen Alexander Solzhenitsyn was arrested and exiled to the West. It's Alexander Solzhenitsyn that so powerfully uncovered the atrocities, the horrors of life in Soviet Russia with his famous book, The Gulag Archipelago. The day that he was arrested, he published one final essay that was to be released to his homeland as he departed for the West. The title of the essay is very helpful for us today. The title was Live Not By Lies. The Soviet people were in a hopeless condition because they were unable to stand up to the power of the state. Listen to how hauntingly relevant these words to the Soviet people in 1974 are to Christians today. Solzhenitsyn wrote, We are approaching the brink. Already a universal spiritual demise is upon us. A physical one is about to flare up and engulf us and our children. But what can we do to stop it? We haven't the strength. It is not every day and not on every shoulder that violence brings down its heavy hand. It's not every Christian that's going to get fired from his job. But what society demands, it demands of us only a submission to lies a daily participation in deceit. And this suffices as our fealty. And therein, we find neglected by us the simplest, the most accessible key to our liberation, a personal non-participation in lies. Even if all is covered by lies, even if all is under their rule, let us resist in the smallest way. Let their rule hold not through me. We are not called upon to step out onto the square and shout out the truth, to say out loud what we think. This is scary. We are not ready, but let us at least refuse to say what we do not think. Our way must be Never knowingly support lies. Friends, that's why we can't celebrate Pride Month. Because it's a lie. That's why we can't use pronouns that call a man a woman. Because to do so would be to participate in a lie. That's why we can't go to homosexual weddings Because as much as we love these people, to go to an event like that would be to celebrate that which the Bible calls an abomination. It would be to take part in a lie. The call upon every Christian man and woman at this hour is to stand. To stand firm in the truth of God's word and to hold fast to the promise of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, the times have really changed. And I know for myself, and I'm sure for all of us, we, we wish that this had not happened in our time. But as J.R.R. Tolkien so eloquently wrote, it is not for us to choose the times we live in, but to know what to do with the times with which we have been assigned. And so, Father, here we are, and our heart as your people is to stand in line with Christians that have gone before us for so many thousands of years, to not be surprised by the evil around us, to recognize the times in which we live, and ultimately, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to stand. Father, I pray that you would help us to stand. 
And I pray that this place, that this church, would be a refuge of truth, especially in this month, in a world that is so filled with lies. Father, we love you and we thank you for the truth that we have in the Bible. We pray that you would bless the rest of our day, for we ask it in Christ's name.